later. Dilwa, you, we actually met again thinking about the nature of religious text and interpretation, going again back to the end of what Rabbi Krishie said about the importance of managing, uh, of managing um, our, our, our difficult texts. You're a trustee also of the Islamic Society of Britain and the Free Face Forum and the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust. So it looks like you've had major events at the rate of two or three a day. Um, I appreciate you very much, very much your, your being here. Thank you very much, um, Rabbi Jonathan Lutzberg. Um, the appreciation and pleasure is actually mine and the honour of being here in the house of God, uh, in, your, in your welcome and in your company. Um, and I, I suppose the primary reason for me to come um, I was in Coventry earlier on, and um, I felt when when Rabbi was discussing this with me and asking me to participate, I, I really felt I had to come. And I think really just to show solidarity at, at a time when I, I know that things are very difficult and very tense for Jewish communities across Europe, but, but here and now, um, fellow citizens here in this country. Um, I thought it was interesting, I mean, I'm going, to, I'm going to focus on the issue of empathy, but, I, but just before that, just to touch upon what happened in Paris. Um, and, I, and by the way, I agreed with what Sugra said and, and what Jonathan has, all, has also said, so I'm not going to repeat what has already been, been mentioned. Um, it was interesting for me to see the slide from an act of murder and terror against what people saw, what they perceived to be um, an offence against their religion. The shootings in the office of the, uh, of, of, the, of the magazine. And then immediately, the day after, for that to be connected with an assault on a, on a supermarket owned by Jewish people. And this connection was the really worry, I mean, of course, the whole thing was worrying. The whole thing was worrying, but this connection was very worrying for me. And I think it speaks volumes of the state of anti-Semitism in our society, that you can associate blasphemy and terror and, and, and an insult to your religion with the Jewish community in France, in Paris. Um, that, was, that was really disturbing to me, and I think that speaks volumes about where we are with the state of anti-Semitism discussions around that. But I also then saw hope. I saw hope in the employee of that supermarket who I think demonstrated a very different perspective, a very different position. May I just say that we tried to find him, to bring him on the line here tonight, but we couldn't actually establish a link in time. But I, I, I saw that as two very different visions of how we can live together. And I think we have to bear in mind both those visions as we try to analyze and look at this problem. I want to say something about empathy because I think, and I'll come back to the issue of freedom and um, what happened in Paris at the end, because obviously we don't have too long. For me, the core of this, and when I think about the broader connection between our communities, and I use the word communities in quotes, and I'll say why um, in, in the next point I'm going to go. I think really the issue is about empathy is can we see the world as human beings, putting aside Jews and Muslims, but as human beings, can we see the world from other people's shoes, by, by walking in other people's shoes? Can we see the world from other people's perspectives? And I think this is a real challenge for all of us. It's a real challenge for human beings. Human history shows that it's a challenge for human beings in a way that it should not be. And I think the enemy of empathy, the enemy of because often when I think of generalized, and I'm going to be very crude and generalized, you know, generalized here, but when I think of Muslim stereotypes of Jews, Jews are very powerful, they control the media, they control the banks, they control the world. And when I think of the way I think that some Jewish people look at Muslims, they're such big in number and they're very influential and powerful and, and so on and so forth. And you know, it's, I think there's a real problem here in us not being able to see the world from each other's perspectives and not being able to see the pain, not being able to feel the pain 
because a true and genuine empathy will not only allow us to see from the other's perspective, that's actually not so difficult, but it's to feel the pain that the other is feeling and live with that pain, bear that pain in our heart so that the other becomes human, the other becomes something, someone like us, someone who's not removed from us, someone who is us. And so my next point would be that the enemy of empathy, I would say, is identity politics, is, a, is when we define ourselves in ways that I don't think God intended us to define. Define when we create barriers. Of course, I'm not saying that religious boundaries should be dismantled. That's not my point at all. But when we define community lines along the lines of our political identities, and then we build that into our religious identity, I think when we create problems for ourselves. So the ideas of victimhood, the ideas of identity politics, I think become a real enemy. That, that pull us away from that more empathetic, I would say, natural human disposition. Um, and, I, and I think our job as leaders, our job as people who want to do good in society is to help our peoples move out of those positions where we sadly can become locked into identity politics, to move out of that and recognize, actually, that the fight isn't between Jews and Muslims. The fight isn't between this group or that group. And here, in my third point, I would want to problematize words like we, us, them, you, community. I want us to think about what these words actually mean. Because I have more in common with you in this room than I have with the people that, that killed those journalists and cartoonists. I have far more in common with you than I have with people running around Iraq and Syria beheading people and killing innocent people. I don't see a I don't see any core here about where my community lies, where my identity lies here. And if I was to somehow be drawn alongside those people, I would see it as an as an as an offence as an insult to my own integrity and to my own identity. My identity as a human being, my identity as someone who passionately believes in God, who believes in the values of openness and justice and equality and fairness, puts me far more in touch, I hope, with the people in this room than it does with the people that I'm describing my contrast. That for me is the demarking, is the demarcating line. <coughs> So the line for me, and I think we need to think about where those boundaries are. Where are the actual conflicts for our society? Is it between Christians and Muslims? Is it between Jews and Muslims? Is it between Hindus and Sikhs? And where are those boundaries? I don't. I, I think. I think. Of course, at some level, those boundaries are there. Of course, they are. But when we dive deeper into those identities, I would like to think that those boundaries are actually quite simplistic that there are different boundaries that we need to explore, the values that we actually hold. And when we actually think about those values, for me, and this is me coming up to the end, it's, it's, if I think of a notion like freedom, and just to touch upon that point, there, I, do, I do not believe that there can be any faith or any faithfulness without freedom. Because Faith without freedom is something that you've been told to do. It's not faith. It's not an option. Without the option to do wrong, I don't think you can ever really choose to do right. An individual, and this goes deeply into the, the Quranic story of how God created human, human beings. In the Quranic narrative, when God is creating human beings, the angels <coughs> object. They raise an objection. And they say, well, we are here to worship you. Why do you want to create this other being? We worship you. If you want someone to worship you, we worship you. This thing will create mischief, will cause chaos <coughs> on the earth. But God in his wisdom decided to create humanity. And he said to the angels, I know that which you do not know. Because the aspiration that God had for us was that actually when we choose to do something, and we choose to do good, we excel and we rise above the station of being of the angels, 
by choosing to be good, by choosing to be, by rejecting evil and choosing to be good. That can only happen when you are free. God could have programmed us to be good, but he didn't. He gave us that freedom. And that's built into our DNA as humanity. And, and then God asks the angels to bow down to Adam, to show that Adam is superior by virtue of his free will to the angels. So for me, hate, for me, freedom is an integral part of who I am as a religious person. And unless somebody also has the freedom not to believe in what I believe, what I believe doesn't really mean anything mm. if someone has simply been forced into it. I think also my last point here is that there's been a real conflation of two different things when you think of freedom. The, the, and there's a problem in the terminology here because Muslims also feel a very strong sense that there is Islamophobia in society. And I think it is, it is our ethical, moral imperative to stand against any form of prejudice, any form of injustice or hatred that we see in society, whether it is anti-Semitism, whether it is Islamophobia, whether it is homophobia, whatever it is. But there is a problem in the configuration of some of these terms. I am very, I am much more comfortable with somebody being able to criticize beliefs, ideas, values, but not, I'm not comfortable with people preaching hatred and violence against people. So there's a difference here. And we already, the law already recognizes this. The law allows for we repealed our blasphemy laws a few years ago because they became redundant. We reached a place, a consensus in British culture that religion, the mockery of religion, was fair game. It, it's, it's okay. Because religious people should be confident enough in what they believe to have that ridiculed and criticized and subject to criticism. But human beings, people who believe in those things, there should not be any hatred projected towards people. <clears throat> if people are subject to violence, hatred, then the law rightly should curtail freedom. Your freedom to criticize does not mean that you also have the right to preach hatred against me or somebody else. And that's why I think where the distinction between, you know, anti-Semitism is a, is, a, is a hatred of the people. It's, it preaches violence against the people. I don't think anybody in this room would have problems with people criticizing Judaism, criticizing the beliefs and ideas. You probably do it more than anybody else. <laughs> and, but, and I think we do have to differentiate between these points. So I, we have to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the emphasis on the emphasis on trying to look at how the world feels from the point of view of the other, and not constructing kind of a fake us and them, but looking at who community really can be. Uh, Morris, I didn't realize that your actual title is Baron Glassman of Stoke Newington and Stamford Hill. I hope it's okay that you're <coughs> uh, Morris. And really a professor of political philosophy in different places in Europe, very involved in London citizens, Director of the Faith and Citizenship Program at London Metropolitan University, and then deeply connected with the Labour Party in the House of Lords. Very concerned with community, Jewish community and community beyond that. Glad to hear your thoughts. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I share your view in Rabbi Johnson. Just hold it near. Just hold it near. Really? Okay. Um, Last week. I find it very difficult to fuse, but for those who are interested and will not be offended by this, the important news is that Spurs are one arm. <laughs> yeah. And I know here in Finsley that's a contested score. It's a club that Arsenal are not involved in. I to say how great it is to be next to you, Dil. Well, we've known each other now a very long time. Um, ten years, and Dil are definitely among the <coughs> among the angels. I've also visited <coughs> work in Leicester, you know, a very hard, um, hard line business institution and, and to see you in the way that you, you are and the way that you grow is just great. So it's, it's really good to, to see you again. I'm sorry for not returning your last call. 
So, um, yeah, I'll get on. I will get on. Um, and then, and then for us to say that it, you know, first of all, that Paris fell, and this all feels like it's not just an attack on Israel anymore, it's an attack on our life, on, on exilic life. That, you know, you go shopping for your shop, shopping and you get killed uh, doing your shopping. This, this, this is just terrible, and it's to acknowledge how, how terrible that feels, and how it could be that we were wrong about a lot of things. That's the anxiety that I have of you know, we could live together in peace, the issues you raised earlier about that, uncontested things. Um, and it's true, what you say, that my experience would confirm what you say, that, that you know, there used to be real right-wing anti-Semitism, real fascist anti-Semitism. So I go out in London every week with the, with the Blue Labour stuff, do a lot of in places like Nottingham and Leicester around that. And, and I, I don't get that much. In fact, I hardly get anything at all from the NF or, or this, but there is, uh, and there certainly is, a default Islamic anti Semitism going on. The Jews are rich, Jews are powerful. And then, and then there's another source of anti Semitism which I haven't mentioned, which is worth checking out, which is a double tragedy for me, which is that there is a real intensity of feeling on the left, that there is an, an obviously. Just imagine being me, you know, that's, <laughs> this is what I can find, very weird and odd views of Jews and that related to Israel from exactly a tradition which could never, I and mean, this is the worst thing about leftists, is that they have no conception of sin, <laughs> right, at least with religious people, they have somewhere along the line some notion that conceivably maybe they'll get to the day of reckoning and they might be found out, but Secular leftists have no day of reckoning, right? We, they have a day of reckoning where they do it to other people, but it's never done to themselves. Now, obviously, that's a tragedy in itself because we know the fate of, of the left understanding, ha, huh, you know, it, these things happen. Um, but nonetheless, there is, and last week it was in Scotland, well, right? in Edinburgh, I know that's not your hometown. But I, I gave a talk to a, let's say, a progressive new king. And there was a really hard view on Israel of that, you know, that basically these, these killings in, in Paris were absolutely analogous to what Israel does every day, as someone said to me. That this was not to be um, distinguished, the idea that you could have a military, you know, I said, well, what about the idea that there's two sides in that that are militarized and this was just the killing of civilians, you know, no. and then there's you know, one of the reasons the right is no longer quite as virulently anti is that there used to be, you know, the idea of the communist Trotsky was the absolute emblem of the communist conspiracy, and Rothschild was the emblem of the international capitalist conspiracy, and obviously they all got together and sure, <laughs> and, you know, worked out their differences to, to control the world, um, <laughs> roughly speaking. Um, but but kind of communism isn't the kind of, uh, as, as you will realise when you mix with people on the left, is no longer quite the threat it used to be. So, so that's died for the, for the right. But for the left, the idea that America is controlled by the Israel lobby, by the Jewish interest, that therefore um, that the media is controlled um, in that way means that essentially um, attacking Israel and standing up to Jewish power is an act of emancipation and truth-telling. You know, that's, it's an act of um, speaking the truth. So th these, are, these are great enemies to be living with in our midst. People who, who hate Jews for being Jews, that's just showing that this is, this is where the space is and, and to find the traditions that are committed to liberty, committed to freedom, and in fact the opposite is very dis disconcerting. So I just want to acknowledge that space of, of, of disconcertion. And I would say that this idea of it's never crossed my mind ever that there wasn't a future for <coughs> Jews in England. Never. You know, but I'm very committed. But you could see the possibilities, you know, a respect left union, sort of Islamic 
that would, you know, that, that would be a very terrible thing that, that would lead to systematic persecution of Jews. Uh, and that's very, very scary. And just the random attacks and the way that people don't acknowledge the sheer intensity of that threat and the way that that's contextualised in wider, you know, geopolitical discussions. I mean, where I entered into this was, remember, East Ham Cemetery. This was the year 2000. <coughs> in English history, and the hundreds of, of gravestones smashed up overnight, which was a local <coughs> group. And I went to try, two, two experiences just to share. I went to try to get the police to make some arrests to push the investigation. No one was arrested. And the, the chief superintendent of Walden Forest, the way the police force, mm -hmm. said to me, very complicated situation in the Middle East. So I just shared that. Oh, well, okay. And then I tried to get it raised by Union of Work, UQ. And I remember Amanda Sacco, who was the head of the Union branch, said, well, to be quite honest, guys, I care a lot more about living Palestinians than I do about dead Jews. And she thought that was completely... But it's very... I'm just sharing that the... This doesn't come out of nowhere, this anxiety. This is a long-standing anxiety that we've had to go through, that our children have to go through at the university if they wish to identify as Jews. It, it's hard going. And then to get to the tragic paradox of that situation, because believe me, you know, statistically, life's never been better. Right? This is the other side of the story. It's really never been, if you, you know, in the House of Lords, please don't publicise this still a while. Um, you could definitely have a reform minion, a liberal minion, a united synagogue, you know, probably service, full service. <laughs> we haven't got there yet with the majority uh, minion, but, you know, I note that it's growing. Um, <laughs> and, and if they still had the Supreme Court in there, you know, I think it would be quiet. Um, <laughs> you know, the judges. Um, that, that the participation of Jews at the highest level of British society is, is you know, Almost be disconcerting if you might say it flat. So, the things that have moved um, incredibly and the full, uh, an, an extraordinary transformation of the community in my lifetime from essentially, I mean, we come from Palm Spring, from essentially cab drivers to lawyers is quite remarkable to witness, and some even have reached the exalted levels of actors. So, uh, you know, there's, there's no limit, it seems, to how high we can go. So that's the, that's where. So on the one hand, life has never been better. Um, the quality of Jewish life and the capacity to organise and to live your life, and yet at the same time, life has never been worse in terms of anxieties. All the time when I meet Jews, there's just an increasing, increasingly high level um, of anxiety. So I, I've got it. I, I just wanted to share that those things that they the, about very the, you know, the best of times and worst of times <coughs> is upon us and to add that there's left that there's that there's causes of that anxiety. It's and then to second on the list. Hmm? It's second on the list. Okay. So it's really important to include it then. Right. For a third, you know, when you don't deliver your second paper stick with your first, I think it was, <laughs> a, it was a better one. Um, it's a good idea to do that. So, coming to the to the final thing, and what I say to you is what Dilwell says here is that we are small people, right? We we've got to remember that that we are very small and, and not a powerful people at all, and that therefore it's all you know. What Isaiah said: "Seek the peace of the city, because in its peace you will find peace." Remains our lodestar always in exile, we have to make friends, we have to give, we have, we must not shrink into being victims, and we must understand what Dilwell says, because when I talked at London now, my students over here in the Muslim, they've never met Jews, they, they assumed that if we didn't run the media, and run law, and run politics, then we had pretty good jobs in those industries, and they weren't wrong, you know, when they're looking into the world, we have more positions of power, we have moved in that direction. And what I realised talking to is the Jewish communities don't have relationships with poor people anymore. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a relationship with your clima? Do you really? You know, do you pay a living wage? Um, we've got to build 
actively build relationships of trust around issues relating to the very conditions of life, you know, the conditions that people work in. I'll never forget the role that Rabbi Wittenberg played in denouncing usurious levels of interest being charged after the crash to poor people, five and a half, six and a half thousand percent. These ideas. In other words, don't lose your nerve. This is not a way not to lose our nerve as a community. I think we've got a lot to teach, but I would also say that we've still got things to learn and, and to be able to be open, to be learning from the poor, to build a common life with other people is, is where we've got to be. And, um, and, and so, you know, liberty and pluralism are not threatened. They are, they are very strong and they are alive. Those aren't really the issues. But how to live well, how to be good, how to, how to do that, to, to relearn how to live politically as a Jewish community that supports ourselves, but in its peace, you will find peace. To have good relations with our poor neighbours is going to be a big priority.